So welcome to the video. Today we're going to take a look at how to do paired samples t-tests on version 29 of SBSS. We'll also take a look at the assumptions of the test, how to check those, how to report those, and of course we'll take a look at how to report the results of the t-test itself. So we're going to use a paired samples t-test, also known as a within participants t-test, when we have a within participants categorical independent variable and a continuous dependent variable. So for this example, let's imagine that we're interested in how symptom scores change before and after some sort of symptom, uh, after some sort of treatment. So in this Excel file, I have before treatment in one column and after treatment are in another column. And these scores represent symptom severity. So let's take a look at how to enter these data into SPSS. So the first thing I'm going to do is go down to variable view and this will take me to this screen. Then I'm going to enter the name of one level of my independent variable into this name column. So I'm going to call that before treatments. I have to use an underscore between the words because SPSS doesn't allow you to use spaces. So before treatments underscore um, and then after underscore treatment. So something like that. And then I'm just gonna use this measures column to specify that we're looking at scale or continuous data. So once I've done that, I'm gonna to go to data view. And I can see that the names of those two levels of the independent variable have appeared above these two columns here. And then I can just copy and paste my data from my Excel file into SPSS. So I'm just going to select that. I'll hit Command C because I'm on a Mac. If you're on a PC, I guess it's Control C and then Command V into the top left cell. And now I have the data in my SPSS file. So the assumption, the main assumption that we have to check of the paired samples t-test is that the differences between the scores are normally distributed. So to do this, we actually have to create a separate variable which represents the differences between the scores before and after treatment. So to do this, we are going to go to transform compute variable. I'm going to move before treatment into this numeric expression box. I'm going to touch this minus symbol and then I'm going to move the after treatments thing over there. So we have before treatment minus after treatment. Then we just need to give this new variable a name. So let's call it something like difference. And once you've got that, you can go down to OK. And that's going to create this difference column for us. And we can see that this just represents the difference in scores between before and after. So we have six minus three equals three, seven minus five equals two, etc. And then we can uh, perform a normality test on that variable that we've just created to check that those data are, norm are normally distributed. So to do this, let's go to analyze and then down to descriptive statistics and then over to explore. And then we're going to transfer that difference variable into this dependent list box. Then we can go to plots. Then we can untick stem and leaf. We can tick histogram. And we can tick normality plots with tests. And then we can go to continue and then to OK. So if we scroll down just a little bit, we get to this test of normality table. And this is actually divided into two sections. So we have this one test on the left and we have this other test, the Shapiro-Wilk test on the right. Normally, if you have a small sample below 50 participants, you're gonna use the Shapiro-Wilk test. So in this example, we just have 20 participants. So we're gonna be looking at the Shapiro-Wilk side of the table. And the most interesting statistic in this table is the SIG value here. We want to see that this is above 0 0.05 and we can see that this value is 0 0.09. So it's above 0 0.05, indicating that the data are normally distributed.
we did also create a histogram as part of this uh, process. And we can see that we kind of have like a normal distribution going on. Although we don't really have enough, enough data uh, for this histogram to look very good, but it's generally in line with um, what this value indicates here. So we've checked that that assumption has been met. If you find that this assumption hasn't been met, you might consider doing a non-parametric version of the paired samples t-test, such as the Wilcoxon test. But since this assumption has been met in this case, let's continue with the test. So to do that, we'll go up to analyze. Then we will go down to compare means and proportions, and then across to paired samples t-test. I'm then just going to transfer one level of my independent variable over to this bit, and then I'll transfer the other level over to the other bit. So it should look something like this. We can see that we've got estimate effect sizes ticked already. So we'll take a look at the effect sizes in the output as well. So once the screen looks something like this, let's just hit continue and that will run the analysis. Okay, so we can see uh, if we look at this paired samples test table, we can see that we have a significant effect of condition on the dependent variable because we have p-values here and here below 0 0.05. So which one of these you look at depends on the type of hypothesis you have. So this says this is one-sided and this is a two-sided hypothesis. These are also known as a one-tailed and a two-tailed hypothesis. So in this case, a one-tailed hypothesis would be something like it was hypothesized that symptom severity scores would be significantly higher in um, significantly higher before treatment compared to after treatment. So you're predicting which level has, is going to have the higher or lower scores. Whereas a two-tailed hypothesis would be something like it was hypothesized that there would be a significant difference between the two levels of the independent variable or before and after um, treatment in this case. So something more general. So yeah, which one of these uh, two columns you look at depends on which type of hypothesis you have. And yeah, um, so if we also look at these paired samples statistics or the statistics in this table, these are essentially descriptive statistics. We can see that the mean score before treatment is 6.95 and the mean score after treatment is 4.3. So this is consistent with the hypothesis that symptom severity scores would be significantly lower after treatments compared to before treatment. So that's basically how you run the test. Let's also just take a quick look at how those results can be reported. Okay, so here's an example of how these results can be reported. Often we can just start with a sentence that indicates what test we used and indicates the variables that we we're looking at. So I've said a paired samples t-test was conducted to compare symptom severity scores before and after treatment. And then before getting into the actual t-test results itself, I've reported the results of the Shapiro-Wilk normality test. So I've said a Shapiro-Wilk test indicated that the differences between the conditions were normally distributed. And then I've entered these statistics here. So let's just take a look at where those statistics come from. So if we scroll back up towards the top of the outputs, we have this tests of normality table again. And we're going to focus still on the Shapiro-Wilk side of the table. And so I've said in this example, W, so that stands for the Wilk, I suppose, um, equals 0.92. And that is this value here in the statistic column, just rounded to two decimal places. In brackets, we have 20, which is the degrees of freedom. We can see 20 here as well. And we have the sig value P equals 0 0.096. And that's what we have here. So once we've reported the shapiro wilk test results, we can report the actual results of the t-test. So let's scroll back down in this outputs and we can take a look at the sentence. So symptom severity scores were significantly higher before treatments compared to after treatment. And I've inserted the descriptive statistics into that sentence. So I've got the mean 
equals 6.95 for before treatment and the standard deviation is 1.05. So that just comes from this paired sample statistics table that we looked at before, 6.95 for the mean and 1.05 for standard deviation. And then that's the same thing here for the after treatment. Mean equals 4.3, standard deviation 0 0.92, and that just comes yeah. from here and here. So next thing is reporting the actual t-test results. So we've got t equals 7.27. So if we look at the paired samples test table, we've got the t value here, t equals 7.266. So I've just rounded that to 7.27 there. The 19 is the degrees of freedom. So that's what I have in brackets here. And then the p-value, p is less than 0 0.001. And that's what we see here, regardless of whether we're looking at the data for at the results for the one-sided or the two-sided hypothesis. So something else we haven't yet looked at is the, the effect size. So I've said the effect size was large, D equals 1.63. And I've gotten that from this paired samples effect sizes table. So we can see Cohen's D in the top row and then the point estimate is 1.625, and then I've just rounded that to 1.63 in the example. So that's essentially all of the results reported. Um, that may be enough, but we could also create a graph as well if we would like to uh, show these results visually. So let's just take a quick look at how to create a graph with these data. So what I'm gonna do is go to graphs, then to chart builder. This dialog box you can normally just ignore, so I'm going to go to OK. Um, and then I'm going to check the bar is selected in this menu here. Then I can either drag this simple bar icon up to here, or I can double click it. So just double click it. And then I'm going to transfer before treatment to the y-axis box. And then I'm going to transfer after treatment as well to the y-axis box. That opens this dialog box and you can just click OK to close that. Then we can just click this display error bars option and I'll just leave the default option selected. So we're going to have error bars for 95% confidence intervals. So once this window looks something like this, you can just go to OK to close that and that will that will create the graph for you. You probably want to edit this graph before using it in your reports. So to do that, I will double click on it to open the chart editor. And then let's start off by editing these big blue bars. So I'm gonna double click on one of the bars. That's gonna open this properties window. I'm gonna click on this bar options tab, and then I can use this width Thing here to decrease the width of the bar. So let's put it down to about 30%. Click apply. I think that looks a lot better. And then I'm going to go up to this arrow here and choose um, the fill and border tab. And then we can just choose a less colorful color. So let's pick like this gray here and click apply. And then we can edit really anything we want in this graph. So I probably don't want this little note here. This is the sort of thing you could actually just create in Word instead. So I'll just delete that by clicking the delete button. And then if you want to edit um, what it says, if you click on, on anything in the graph once and then on it again, you'll be able to edit what is written. So I'll just delete that underscore and then I'll probably just do the same for this side. And then you can also just uh, change the font size and style to match your preferences. So I'll click on uh, these numbers on the y-axis and that opens uh, this properties um, window. And then I can just choose, for example, the font that I'm using in my report, so Times New Roman. And then as this looks a bit small, we can increase the size as well to make that a bit easier for the reader to read. So I'll put it up to 16 and then click apply. 
and that looks much easier to read now. So basically you can do that kind of thing for any aspects of the figure that you would like to change. And any changes you make within the chart editor will be saved automatically. So you can just close this and you can see that this chart is updated in the SPSS output file. So that's essentially it. Um, if you have any questions about anything, just leave me a comment and I will try to get back to you. Thanks a lot for watching and I will see you next time.